Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to New York University, Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimò, uh, for this event organized by the Centro Primo Levi here in New York. It's a presentation of The Heart of a Stranger. I'm going to ask my colleague and friend Natalia Indrimi to introduce the event and to introduce the speakers of the night. I'm here just to pitch you the exhibit that we have upstairs because I believe pretty strongly that it's related to the uh, topic of this evening. Uh, they are drawings by Carlo Levi, and some of you might be familiar with the other Levi of Italian literature as the author of Christ Stopped at Eboli, um, a celebrated memoir, documentary, uh, autobiography, as you wish to call it, in which Carlo Levi, who was an anti-fascist and who had been sent to internal exile, confino, internal confinement, in a small, forgotten by God place in southern Italy where he could have no contact with anybody, uh, recounts his experience there. So that's the claim to fame of Carlo Levi for the majority of us. But uh, Carlo Levi was a trained physician, really considered himself a painter more than anything else, and who became a writer because he felt the need to tell the story of his exile. Uh, upstairs we have a very concentrated body of his drawings, um, basically, these are drawings that he produced at the time of an illness that almost uh, made him blind. And he found a way to organize with specific tools, a, a way to both write and draw. And this is the first time that his drawings are visible outside of Italy. So I, I'm kindly inviting you to take a good look at them. Uh, it's really, um, they're really drawings that are about his inner self. Uh, when he could not see outside of him. So take a look at them, and I think it's the perfect visual coronation of this evening. And without further ado, I would like to ask Natalia Indrimi to come to the podium. Thank you. Thank you, Stefano, and thanks, everybody, at Casa Italiana del Di Marimo, and thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, this is our first event of a long collaboration with Casa Italiana of many years and uh, will be followed by two events for the centennial of Primo Levi in October and uh, November, and I invite everybody to um, keep track of the calendar. Tonight, um, uh, we are uh, here to present a new book, a wonderful anthology of poetry and, uh, po and, po and prose edited by Andre Nafis Saili. Uh, the speakers that will join us and that Andre will introduce are Aaron Robinson, uh, Robertson, of the, is the editor of the Lit Hub, that is a wonderful uh, literary blog that I'm sure everybody is familiar with, and the poets and translator are uh, Jenny Shi, uh, Jonathan Galassi, Sinan Antun, and Ji Leonko. Uh, we met, I met Andre um, a few years ago when he, his first volume of this translation of Alessandro Spina's work came out. Spina was the pen name of the Libyan writer Basili Shafiq Kuzan. It was immediately clear that uh, the questions raised by Andre in his work on the self and the other, on Mediterranean culture, on translation and longing, were close to some of the central themes that have guided the work of Centro Primo Levi. When we can, can sit at the same table, who is a stranger and who, what is home, are questions with more than one answer. And uh, if there is one thing that his anthology does very well, is to lead us emotionally and intellectually in many different directions, almost to make sure that there is not one answer to these questions and that the work continues. As other projects by Andre, this anthology is strongly personal. Born in Abu Dhabi by, to a Venetian mother and an Iranian father, in an article that appeared uh, um, some years ago in the New Statesman, he stated, in practical or not, Abu Dhabi is my home and I don't need a passport to, to prove it. 
it seems to me that his intuition is very much at the heart of this book, too. As I set off on the journey through religion, mythology, history, and politics, from the Torah to the Ramayana, to tales of Greek gods, to the political meaning of exile in ancient Greece and uh, the Roman Empire, exile began to surface as a place where meaning falls apart, between our love for the places that have made us whole and concepts that have been conflated with that love, such as citizenship and war and law. And I think this is a, the, a reflection that very much is aligned with what uh, the center is uh, doing today. And I am very pleased to present this anthology. Andre is an accomplished translator and poet. His recent collections of poems are The Promised Land, Poems from Itinerant Life, uh, poetry, the poetry pamphlet The Other Side of Nowhere, and uh, this anthology that he edited and just came out. Uh, please welcome Andre Nafisseli. Thank you, Natalia, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and thank you all for being here. Um, I also wanted to thank, more officially, the Centro Primo Levi and Casa Italiana for <laughs> hosting this event. Um, this is actually my second time here. The first time I was here was a few years ago uh, when I actually did an event with uh, Jonathan Galassi, who will uh, read for you tonight as well. And that, on that occasion, we were talking about Primo Levi's poetry. Um, so yeah, I, I think, strangely enough, because it does feel strange when you've spent so long on a project, um, after about sitting in my head for about 10 years, um, this book required about three years of assemblage. And I'm very happy to be, be able to talk to you about it tonight. This is only my second event about the book. Um, before I, I, I say anything else about the book, uh, what I thought I'd do, because the way tonight was really designed was to, let's say, create a showcase of samples, a smorgasbord, if you will, from the book, to be able to introduce you to some of the themes that the anthology discusses. But before I say anything more about the anthology itself, I wanted to read one of my favorite contributions to the book. Um, quite often, I think, in the past, ever since people realized that I was putting this kind of book out, everyone's been telling me how propitious a moment it is, how uh, relevant a theme exile is. And I think assembling the book actually, it, uh, it led me to a single discovery, really, which is that exile has never really fallen out of fashion. Our history is determined by exile. Um, in fact, there can be no such thing, really, uh, as civilization without the concept of exile alongside with it. You cannot create a community without excluding others from it. And, of course, we're living in times way of hypernationalism, uh, nativism, when certain groups of people feel that they have a unique right to a certain specific geographical place. And the contribution I want to read to you today is one that really defies that very notion. And it is an origin myth uh, written by the Romani author Valdemar Kalinin, who uh, belongs to a community that, of course, has been vilified uh, for, for many, many centuries. And uh, he was born in Belarusia in the late 1940s and has lived in exile in the UK for the past 25 years. And the story I'm about to read you really is a typical example, I would say, of Romani literature because uh, over the course of succeeding generations, a lot of Romani authors have attempted to basically create origin myths for that community because their historical origins are still fairly nebulous to this day. I think contemporary scholarship tends to point to the fact that they originated somewhere in northern India, migrated through the Persian Empire at the time, worked their way up along the Mediterranean coast, and eventually wound up in Europe, where a lot of those communities remain today. This story is called, And the Romani Set Off. Once upon a time, many thousands of years ago, all sorts of people lived in the Garden of Eden. It was the most beautiful garden. Do you know what I mean by paradise? It's a sophisticated sort of place where truthful people lived in great comfort. They worked hard and had plenty of everything. Now, one day, believing his people were ready for it, God decided to give them all their own countries and scatter them to the four corners of the earth. He announced the day on which they should present themselves before him to claim their title deeds 
bearing God's own official seal. But since, as you know, God lives in inaccessible light, it was his angels who dealt with people. On the appointed day, the weather was exceptionally lovely. The morning was warm and the birds were singing. Ah, if only we knew what those birds looked like and the sound of their song. Anyway, the Romani man was so soundly asleep that he overslept his appointment. One can only imagine the profound sleep induced by that garden, shadowed as it must have been by sweetly scented flowers and lulled by the quiet murmuring of distant streams. Suddenly, he was abruptly woken by the sound of joyful singing nearby. Indeed, it was only when some gajo tripped over him that he sat up. Gajo is the Romani word for outsider. Why are you all so happy? The Romani asked. Because I was given my land, the gajo said, and I am going to cultivate it. Hurry up, Rom, otherwise you might be given barren land. And he hurried along on his way. The Romani man set off to the Paradise Palace, and on his way he met different gajo neighbors who told him the good news of their newly inherited land. The Rom realized that by the time he reached the palace, there would be nothing left for him, so he decided it would be better not to ask. When he arrived at the palace, Everyone was busy discussing the technicalities of settling their lands and dividing up the countries with the angels. The senior angel asked the Romani man what he wanted. Nothing special, said the Romani man. I just want to thank God and the angels for this wonderful life in the Garden of Eden. But what country would you like, asked the angel. I'm happy to stay right here, said the Romani. Let me once again express my gratitude on behalf of all these people. However, there is one small thing. Maybe you would let me visit my neighbors from time to time in their new countries. The angel said, because you are the only one who asks God for nothing, you are hereforth given the right to wander the face of the earth, to visit all its countries and stay there as long as you like. The Romani man thanked the angel and set off on a long journey across the countries of his neighbors. And that is why he continues to roam to this day. So, I suppose you launch a book, you begin with the obvious. Um, the Heart of a Stranger, which of course is the title here, is taken from the book of Exodus. And many of you might be familiar with that quote. I'm reading it here in the King James Version. Also, thou shalt not oppress a stranger, for you know the heart of a stranger seeing you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Now, when I was saying earlier that exile is not exactly a new theme, in fact, it's, 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 a, it's a concept, it's a practical activity that's really shaped civilization from our earliest origins. It's perhaps interesting to remember now that, you know, uh, a lot of the, the West and countries outside the West have fallen to, into the grips of what some commentators call reality TV governments. This country certainly qualifies as one of them. And it's, it was interesting while I was putting this book together to note that, in a sense, Exile was uh, the background to one of the first non-filmed uh, reality TV programs that some of the earliest civilizations put together. The Greeks had a very interesting practice, um, which nowadays we call ostracism, but in all honesty, it was a lot more fun than it sounds. Um, what it was was whenever they, the Athenians in particular excelled at this game or tradition, as they called it, uh, whenever a wealthy individual looked like they were ex about to exceed their station, looked like they were about to tear society down for their own profit, for their own uh, sense of pleasure sometimes, for their own ego, the Greeks would assemble in the Agora and they would put it to a contest. So in, in a similar way to uh, American Idol or whatever those shows are called, um, the Greek, the Athenian citizens would write the name of the intended exile, the person they most wanted to exile, on broken shards of pottery. And then the broken shards, just like today you text in your, your favorites to the program, they would tally up the broken shards and the person with the most broken shards would eventually be exiled. The practice actually proved so, let's say, useful and uh, efficient that it spread all over the Greek-speaking world. In Sicily, the only uh, difference was that instead of using broken shards of pottery, they would write the name of the intended exile on uh, leaves from the olive tree. So it's a, it's a tradition that really persisted for a long time. 
Um, in a sense, perhaps we should bring it back. Uh, that, that might change a few things. I mean, it would be good to get rid of all the Trumps and Berlusconis of the world. Um, so, this anthology represents, it includes 100 contributors uh, who are writing in 25 languages and they hail from six continents. Of course, to introduce them all, even in a cursory way, um, uh, would be quite a fool's errand for this particular launch. Um, but I wanted to mention some of my more, some of the more affecting pieces in the book. I think one of the contributions that I most enjoyed was Saul Plaki, the South African writer Saul Plaki's um, works on how his communities in South Africa were essentially taken over by Afrikaners. Um, then there is a wonderful riveting account, really, by Ngugi Wan Thiongo, uh, who writes about the, the uh, white English community in Kenya uh, during the final days of the colonial presence. And those are contributions really not to be missed. But there's a poem that I think I'd like to read now, just as a segue to introducing the wonderful readers I have uh, joining me here tonight. And it's by the Iranian poet Kaveh Basiri. And it's quite simply called The 99 Names of Exile. Adam and Eve, afflicted, afraid, alien, banished, beggar, castaway, colonist, condemned, crippled, dangerous, dark, deportee, deserter, detested, different, dirty, disgraced, disinherited, dismissed, disowned, displaced, dispossessed, dyke, emigrant, ethnic, evil, exotic, expatriated, expelled, extraterrestrial, foreign, forsaken, guilty, heretic, homeless, homesick, impure, infectious, inhuman, insurgent, invisible, Ishmael, Jew, Kashmiri, lost, malefactor, marooned, mysterious, nigger, non-citizen, non-conformist, other, outcast, outlaw, outsider, overseas, pariah, queer, refugee, resident alien, runaway, scapegoat, squatter, stateless, stranger, street Arab, Terrorist, traitor, trespasser, unclean, uncorrectable, undesirable, undomesticated, unfit, unfortunate, unidentified, uninvited, unknown, unnamed, unrecognized, <coughs> unskilled, unspeakable, unthinkable, untouchable, unusual, unwanted, unwilling, unworthy, victim, villain, virus, wanderer, witch, wrong, X, yellow, zero. So these are the 99 names of exile. And I think in some way that, that poem really encapsulates a lot of the um, contributions present in the book. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Jenny Z. I'm just going to be reading her bio here. Jenny Z is the author of Eye Level, which was published by Grey Wolf Press in 2018. Winner of the 2017 Walt Whitman Award of the Academy of American Poets and a finalist for the National Book Award. And Nowhere to Arrive, one of my favorite pamphlets, Northwestern University Press 2017, which is the recipient of the 2016 Drinking Gourd Prize. Jenny teaches at NYU, and it's my great pleasure to invite her on stage to uh, read her contribution to this anthology. Please give her a warm welcome. Hi, everyone. I'd like to thank Andre for gathering us for this occasion on the launch of such a richly curated anthology, which I'm very honored to be part of. My contribution falls in the rootless section of the anthology, and rootlessness has been a kind of refrain in my life. I immigrated to the US from China when I was young, following the migration of my parents. I lived for a few years in Hong Kong and Southeast Asia, and I feel very much at home in, in feelings of doubleness. So this poem comes out of those years I lived in Southeast Asia, and it is in many ways thinking through how being in an unfamiliar place um, and an unfamiliar context heightens a certain kind and activates a kind of attention. And in encountering that which is strange outside of oneself, you are made to confront all that is strange within. Rootless. Between Hanoi and Sapa, there are clean slabs of rice fields and no two brick houses in a row. I mean, no three. 
see countings hard and half sleep, and the rain pulls a sheet over the sugar palms and their untroubled leaves. Hours ago, I crossed a motorbike with a hog strapped to its seat, the size of a date pit from a distance. Can the solitude be rootless, unhooked from the ground? No matter. The mind resides both inside and out. It can think itself and think itself into existence. I sponge off the eyes, no worse for wear. My frugal mouth spends the only foreign words it owns. At present, on the sleeper train, there's nowhere to arrive. Me? I'm just here in my traveler's clothes, trying on each passing town for size. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jenny, for that poem. Um, the next reader I wanted to introduce tonight um, is Aaron Robertson. Aaron Robertson has written for various publications, including the New York Times, The Nation, N Plus One, the Los Angeles Review of Books, and more. And he is currently an editor at Literary Hub. He won a 2018 Penheim grant for his translation of Ijaba Shego's Beyond Babylon, which I recommend that you all read. Please give um, Aaron a warm welcome. Good evening, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, thanks to Andre for inviting me to be a part of this anthology in some small way. Uh, so today I'm going to be um, reading and talking to you very briefly about uh, the author um, whose work I translated for this anthology. Her name is Martha Nazibu. Uh, and she has a pretty remarkable story. So she was born in 1931 in Ethiopia. Uh, her father's name was, was Nazibu Zemanuel. And for a, a time from 1922 to 1932, he was Lord Mayor of uh, Addis Ababa. Uh, and later during the Second Italo-Ethiopian War, he, uh, he served as the commander of the armed uh, forces of Emperor Haile Selassie. Um, and so Martha Nazibu um, and her family, she had her mother and three siblings. Um, during this war, well, so she was a part of the, uh, the Ethiopian aristocracy, this this class of nobles called the Mekwanit. Um, unfortunately, her father was killed uh, because of complications um, when the fascists dropped mustard gas uh, on the Ethiopian army. Um, many people, you know, suffered consequences later on. After her father died, she and her family were exiled from Ethiopia for eight years, um, and they moved uh, uh, to various countries, so mostly Italy, but also uh, Greece, Eritrea, Libya as well. Um, and she's actually still living. Uh, I think she's in the south of, of France somewhere now, actually. But in 2005, she wrote uh, her, her only book um, called, uh, well, I've translated it as Memories of an Ethiopian Princess. Um, and so the passage that I'm going to read uh, to you is when she and her family are currently on uh, in Naples. Um, they are being guarded by, uh, by fascists. Um, they are kind of, you know, under uh, police surveillance. So I will read that to you now. It sometimes seemed that fascist officials decided our fate, using us like pawns on a chessboard. After a long period of calm, two carabinieri knocked at our door and informed us that we had to leave Naples. They would come take us away the next day. 
Evidently, our travails hadn't ended. At daybreak one day in May 1938, the, the 11 of us uh, hastily boarded a ship that was going to the island of Rhodes in the Aegean Sea. Mother entrusted our kind neighbors to inform the schools of our absence, sine die. When we got to the island, we were sent to a villa with a sprawling garden. The kids were quick to notice a wonderful swing hooked to the highest branch of a soaring walnut tree. It was our consolation and the fulcrum of our games. The first thing we did was divide the uh, parts of the tree between us. Basil, the only one who could venture up to the topmost branches, took over that section. Those of us who were smaller acquired the more modest lower branches. Upon awakening each morning, we made our way to the, gig to the gigantic tree and climbed, exultant, on our own branch and began daydreaming. So many adventures took place on that venerable tree. We used the swing to see who could launch themselves the highest into the air and who, from that height, could jump the farthest onto the ground. There were so many thrills and so much laughter that leavened our days. At any rate, nature, as the saying goes, is generous with those who live peacefully with her. The tree rewarded us for lavishing it with attention and distracting it from its loneliness by bearing fruit in abundance. We made huge feasts out of its exquisite walnuts. But Mother was the bulwark that put our hearts at ease. Her inner strength flowed from the faith she had in a, in a divine plan, which was always the fount of her uh, inspiration. At Sade, continued believing that the impossible could become real with God's help. Mother, who tirelessly advocated for the usefulness of our studies despite the constant movements that rudely interrupted them, enrolled us in new schools wherever we went. This time, however, in Rhodes, she didn't find religious schools willing to take us in, and so we had to remain at home. God will provide. Don't be afraid. She comforted us and never stopped hoping for better days, when we would finally be able to live normal lives. The military surveillance was very discreet in Rhodes. Wherever we went, we never saw them. Look, they're hiding in the bushes, Basile shouted to get under our skin when we least expected it, or watch out for our shadows behind those plants, and so on. It was torture. Always the prankster, he never hesitated to joke to make us laugh. But when Mother happened to hear him being a smart aleck, she always cautioned him, careful, Basile, these people don't play around. We could roam around roads feeling something quite like freedom. I have a wonderful recollection of the island, bright and bursting with greenery, where the intense blue of the sea and the white houses mirroring one another created a suggestive contrast, and the streets were paved with natural colored mosaics, ochre, burnt sienna, evergreen, gray, black and white, that left magnificent uh, arabesques on the pavement. The islanders were obliging and jocular. Guided by friends from the area, we could admire art and architecture and visit the Bottega of consummate goldsmiths who fashioned ornate filigreed objects, mostly Maltese crosses, the, the symbol of the knights, Hospitalier. Our coerced stay, however, lasted only three months. On October 2nd, 1938, we were yet again put on a steamer that brought us back to Naples, where we stayed until, until July 1939. It was as if the fascists were trying to hide us from encroaching spirits. It's impossible to give a sensible explanation for such paranoid frenzy. We had become cumbersome merchandise and could no longer make sense of our movements. 
In Italy, however, word was going around that Mussolini no longer wanted these Abyssinian Negroes in Italian territory. Whether or not that was true, on July 19, 1939, we were once more cast out to sea and making our way to Tripoli. The more I think of it, calendars no longer had any use in our nomadic lives. Only the shifts in climate told us that spring or winter had arrived. We changed schools, teachers, and friends with each move from one country to another, and this went on for who knows how long. We attended a school just in time to learn some geography, the formation of clouds and their names, cumulus, cirrus, cumulonimbus, cirrus stratus, etc., or the history of Rome, Romulus and Remus, the she-wolf, Numa Pompilius and the other kings, right when we smiled at our classmates in the hope of finally finding a little friend, we were forced to embark toward a new destination. Thanks. Thank you, Aaron, for that wonderful reading. I really appreciated it. And actually, now that you've heard from two of our speakers, before I introduce the third one for tonight, I actually wanted to um, make a point, really, based on their readings, which is that, of course, when one mentions the literature of exile, it, it will be quite obvious for me to state that I could have filled six or seven of these volumes and still had um, pieces that I couldn't have been able to include. What really helped me in putting t together the selection was that I felt it was necessary uh, to really provide the reader with an experience, with a tactile experience of what exile looked like, felt like, smelled like. I, I think there's a lot of, when you look at the literature of exile, sometimes it seems to be produced in that vacuum, but it doesn't really talk about the nature of that situation. And I think Aaron's translation of Martha Nasibu's memoir, I think really does that to great effect, as does Jenny's poem. Um, and of course, this is also a good moment to mention that, uh, again, almost needless to say, um, this book wouldn't really exist without uh, all the wonderful poets and translators that collaborated with me on it. And I should add gratis, too. Um, blame that on publishing or the lack of a reader's public, but um, I, I just wanted to express my, my gratitude to everyone who contributed their work and essentially made this book what it is. Um, the next reader I wanted to introduce for you now is uh, Sinan Antun, who of course to um, readers of Arabic literature really requires no introduction. Sinan Antun is an Iraqi-born poet, novelist, scholar, and translator. He holds degrees from Baghdad, Georgetown, and Harvard, where he specialized in Arabic literature. His award-winning books include Ijam, The Corpse Washer, The Baghdad Eucharist, and most recently, The Book of Collateral Damage. His works have been translated into 14 languages, and he is an associate professor here at NYU. Please give a warm welcome to Sinan. Uh, thank you so much. And I want to uh, uh, echo the thanks to Andre. I'm really delighted to be part of this project in a very small way. And very happy to be here and to read the poem that I translated um, by an Iraqi poet by the name of Sargon Bolus. And I have to say a few things about him to contextualize the poem. Sargon Bolus was born in, in Iraq in 1944. And in 1967, he went to Beirut, which at the time was kind of beginning to become a laboratory for Arab modernity and Arab radical politics and stayed there for two years and then came to New York and lived in the Bay Area. And he was early on, even while he was still back in Iraq, was translating into Arabic uh, poetry from English. And in addition to being one of the most important poets in the last 40 years writing in Arabic, he's also a major translator who's translated about 4,000 pages of poetry through English from all over the world. Um, he... he um, there are, in a way, generally two phases in his life. In the, in the 60s and 70s, he was very liberal and bohemian, and, but in beginning with the 80s, and I think influenced by the politics of the Bay Area and of this country, he started to be disenchanted with 
that other idea of the U.S., seeing what the U.S. was doing in Central and South America. But the 1991 Gulf War and the, the first stage of destruction of Iraq really left an impact on how he viewed himself as an Iraqi American and his writing. So while we have a lot of writers beginning uh, writing kind of uh, very political poetry and then mellowing down and becoming more liberal, he's, he kind of went the other direction. And of course, the 2003 invasion and occupation of Iraq uh, further alienated him and embittered him, especially in, in the sense that he kept repeating in interviews that the great majority of American poets did not even engage with the two wars that the U.S. was waging. So anyway, he started to spend more time in in Germany, and he died in Berlin in 2008. And the poem that I'm going to read is from his last posthumous collection called uh, Another Bone for the Tribe's Dog. And um, many of those poems are conversations with other poets, Cesar Vallejo, but also uh, Du Fu, the Chinese poet. And for an obvious reason, he kind of went back and had conversations with other poets who experienced uh, war and destruction. So this poem is called Du Fu in Exile, and he starts it with an epigraph uh, from Du Fu, and for him those, according to Du Fu, these uh, words summarize human history, which is the smoke of war is blue, human bones are white. And the poem goes like this. Du Fu reaches a village. A fire is about to go out. He arrives knowing that the word, like his dying horse, might not stay in bloom after all these catastrophes without a handful of grass. How many battlefields did he pass through in which the wind howled, the rider's bones mixed with those of his own horse, and soon thereafter, the grass hid the rest. A fire warming two hands, the head droops, the heart is firewood. He started wandering at 20 and never found a place to settle until the end. Wherever he went, war and its burdens were there. His daughter died in a famine. It is said in China that he wrote like the gods. Dofu reaches another village. Smoke billows from his kitchens. The hungry wait at the door of a bakery. The baker's sweaty faces are mirrors attesting to the fire's ferocity. Dofu is you, sir, the master of exile. Thank you. So just to build on what I was saying earlier, and thank you, Sinan, for that um, wonderful translation, a great poem, I think. Um, as I was saying earlier, you know, this book wouldn't have happened without the contributors featured in it. And uh, although it's, it's true, really, that books are created in, uh, in a solitary vacuum a lot of times, in this case, I was actually pleased to be in contact with so many of the contributors. In fact, many of the people whom you're hearing from tonight, I am meeting them for the first time at this event. So I think that was definitely part of the pleasure in assembling this project. The next reader we have for you tonight is Jonathan Galassi. Jonathan Galassi is the author of the poetry collections Morning Run, North Street, and Left Handed, as well as the novel Muse, which was published in 2015. Galassi, of course, is also very well known as an eminent translator of Italian poetry. He has worked on Eugenio Montale's prose and poetry, Primo Levi's poetry, and um, also Primo Levi's too. And uh, please welcome him to the stage tonight to read about uh, Giacomo Leopardi. Thank you, Andre. It's such an honor to be part of this great project. Um, uh, the 
the poem that uh, you asked me to read is a poem about Dante by Leopardi. And Leopardi was um, a young man when Italy was still um, an, uh, occupied by various um, foreign powers, um, mainly the Austrians. And uh, he, he became a hero to the Risorgimento, to the political movement uh, that, that sought to make Italy uh, uh, a country again. And um, his, some of his early poems, including this one, which he wrote when he was about 20 or 21, were the kind of clarion call for, the, for that kind of thing. Um, uh, this poem is about the building uh, of a statue in honor of Dante in Florence, well, which there had not been since uh, his death in exile in uh, the early 1300s. So the, the happening of this, uh, the creation of this monument by this group of concerned citizens was a kind of act of political um, um, expression and, um, and um, a Leopardi saw it as an occasion for exhortation to Italians to, to, be, to become Italian. Uh, but I, I thought before I read some of this, it's a very long poem, so I'm not going to burn you with the whole thing, but I would, would like to read the few lines of Dante that I think are the ultimate expression of what exile is, where he says, Come sa di sale il pane d'altrui, e come duro cale lo scendere il salir per le altrui scale. Which means what it's like, how, it, how the bread of another tastes of salt, because Florentine bread didn't have salt. <laughs> and how, what a hard road it is to go up and down other people's stairs. And that, that is, I think, the most eternal statement of the difficulty of exile that, that has ever been written. So, so here's a little, some of the endless on the monument to Dante being erected in Florence. Although peace is gathering our people under her white wings, Italian minds will not be freed from their age-old drowsiness if this great land will not return to the example our forefathers set. O oh, Italy, let it be in your heart to honor the ancients, for this land has no such men today and no one to honor. Turn back, my country, look back on that infinity of immortals and weep with shame, for grieving without shame is senseless. Turn back and be ashamed and shake yourself awake and let the memory of those ancestors and what feebly followed stab you. A stranger singular in attitude and cast of mind and speech traveled through Tuscany seeking the tomb of the poet thanks to whom Homer does not stand alone. And to our shame he learned that since that poet's death his ashes and his bones still lie in exile and incredibly not a single monument was raised within your walls to him whose greatness Florence means the whole world honors you. O oh, patriots, who will set our country free from this disgrace? You undertake a noble task, generous and noble band, and anyone who loves Italy will love you for it. So I, um, uh, uh, he, he talks about the, the shame of Italy, the dishonor, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but then he, uh, talks about the dishonor and the shame of being um, oppressed by Napoleon, basically, um, uh, and being soldiers, uh, mercenary soldiers serving uh, in Russia for them, 
And um, that's really the best part of the poem, so I'll read you a little bit of that. Uh, 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 how did we come to these corrupted times? Bitter fate, why give us life or else why not an earlier death when you see our country enslaved by profane foreigners, her virtue cut to ribbons by their biting steel? No help or comfort, we weren't given any way of lessening the relentless pain that tore at her. Alas, you didn't take our blood or life, beloved country, and I haven't died for your cruel fate. So rage and pity overwhelm the heart. For many of us also fought and fell, but not for dying Italy, for her tyrants. <clears throat> Your country doesn't grieve for you, but for him who made you fight against her. So she weeps bit as bitterly as ever, and her tears are mixed with you. If only pity for her whose glory excelled all others came alive in those who love her and can save her, exhausted and lethargic as she is from such abyssal darkness. Mm -hmm. Glorious spirit, tell me, has your love for your Italy died? Has the fire that gave you life gone cold? Will the myrtle that assuaged our sadness for so long never turn green again? Have all our crowns been scattered on the ground? Will she never rise again to resemble you in any way? Did we die for all eternity? Will our shame never end? I, while I'm alive, shall keep exhorting, turning back to your ancestors, corrupted sons. Look at these ruins, these pages, canvases, these stones and temples. Think what earth you walk on. And if the light of these examples fails to inspire you, what are you waiting for? Arise and go. Such low behavior is unworthy of this nurse and teacher of great spirits. If she is the home of cowards, better she be a widow and alone. You can see he was a difficult customer. <laughs> he, was one, he was one of those who Seamus Heaney described as an inner emigre, someone who was not at home, who was in exile himself in his own place. I think that's another form of exile that's very important. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for that. And um, I'm, I'm really glad, actually, that you, um, you brought up Dante, um, especially his line, you shall discover how salty is the savor of someone else's bread. In fact, um, those lines, as some of you will probably know, are taken from Cacciaguida's prophecy uh, in, in, in the Paradiso. And uh, that specific canto, or that selection from that canto, is actually included in the book. Um, one of the things I, I should add about the book as well is that what this is really in, 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 uh, to encapsulate it, this is, and I know it sounds fairly pretentious, but it, it was the aim. This is essentially a history of civilization told through the literature of exile. And despite some odd choices here and there, it is for the most part chronological. Tonight's reading wasn't, but the book is assembled that way. It runs really from ancient Egypt. Um, the first contribution is a wonderful uh, adaptation of an Egyptian myth by one of my favorite authors, Naguib Mahfouz. Um, and so the book begins with that and then proceeds in a more old-fashioned chronological approach from that point in. Um, our final reader for tonight is um, one of the poets I included right at the end of the anthology. In fact, his poem appears alongside Jenny's, and I'm a very big fan of his work. Um, Ji Leon Ko is a poet and essayist from Singapore living in New York City. He's the author of Steep Tea, which is published by Carcanet which was a Financial Times Best Book of the Year and was also a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award in 2016. He has published three other books of poems and a book of Zui Hitsu. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, he is the organizer of Singapore Unbound, which runs the biennial Singapore Literature Festival NYC and the Sacred Saturdays Reading Series. Please welcome Ji Leonko to the stage. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Andre, for including my work in the anthology. 
16 years ago, I exiled myself from uh, Singapore to New York. But that's not quite correct, is it? Because exile is something forced on one and not something that one has chosen. However, of course, exile is not just political, but also spiritual. So I think it is correct to say that I was exiled uh, from Singapore to New York 16 years ago. And the poem included in the anthology is my poem written for the poets back home. To a young poet, quit the country soon as you can, before you're set on a career path or marrying the home ownership scheme. Pay no heed to the village elders. They are secretly ashamed that they did not leave. Quit the country, but do not shake the dust of your feet against it. But instead, we leave with a secret smile for all that leaving has to teach you. Learn what it is to be welcomed for the coin in your purse, for strong hips in pushing a cart uphill, a firm voice in a good course. When the welcome wears off, as it will, learn to leave again, this time by the sea. Be always on your way, and on arrival, sleep with anyone who asks. You never know what gift they may have for you in the morning. You will discover suddenly, or over the course of a winter night, what gift you have for them. Always kiss goodbye on the lips. There will be seasons of great loneliness. You cannot outrun it. So sit and survey the thunderless desert. In every town, pick up the local accent and blend it into yours, already impure, as a secret ingredient is fused into the top note of a perfume. Hearing you, the Tavena will wonder where you are from. Drink deep of your wonderment. Do not betray it. After you leave a good tip for the barkeep, climb to your narrow room and write whatever you wish. Your flowers will grace the sweaty brow of a buffalo. Your politics will smell of perfume. If you write about the old country, you will write about a lover who leaves your side in the night to stand by the window and look up at the crescent moon. Thank you. Thank you so much, G, for that wonderful poem. Um, I honestly think that's a perfect note to conclude on. Um, I hope you enjoyed the selection of readings tonight. I, I believe uh, there can be a Q&A if people are interested. If not, I think we can repair to the, uh, to the reception. Uh, I am happy to take questions, but um, yeah. Does anyone have one? Or I'm sure the mic can be brought over. No? Fantastic. All right, let's proceed to the reception. Thank you very much. Thank you.